Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the newest episode of Talk Scottish Football. The podcast is back uh, after a few weeks without one. The full-on podcast is here. Today, a very special edition indeed. David, nice of you to join me as normal. But uh, I believe that I've got a a better guest on with me today. Uh, Ah, right. Well, we'll see. (laughs) I'm joking. We've we've got an absolute star of the broadcasting game. Uh, A man whose voice you will probably know before you know his face, Mr. Derek Ray. The voice of FIFA 20 as well. Uh, The voice of uh, German, Scottish and uh, many other types of football, if you like, who will be joining us today. Uh, I mean, a man who's, you know, been there, done it all from the from the 80s until now. Uh, seen some big moments. We've got a lot of stuff we're going to cover with him uh, as we prepare for his uh, arrival here, here in the call. I mean, we're talking about a man who's commentated on World Cups, the Champions League, the English Premier League, the Bundesliga, the Scottish Premier League, all the rest of it. Yep. I mean, you know, he has been there and done it. I mean, when you're talking people uh, at the top of their game uh, in the broadcasting field, this is one of the, the top men. And uh, even if you've not listened to the man speak before on the stories and such, I'm sure we're going to get some interesting ones out for you today. So, uh, without any you know, further ado, let's uh, get Derek involved. Let's get into the newest edition of the podcast. And this is Talk Scottish Football, meeting Derek Ray. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now joined by the, the man himself. You may know him, you may know his voice from FIFA if you're a bit of a, a younger viewer as well. It's Mr Derek Ray. Derek, thank you very much for joining us on uh, Talk Scottish Football. It's a pleasure to have you here. The pleasure's all mine, Ryan and David. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, David has been absolutely buzzing for this all week. And so have I, as, as, as someone who I've, uh, of course, listened to many a game over the past few years in both Scottish and German football, it is, uh, it's, it's quite weird to actually hear your voice talking to me, I must admit. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite surreal uh, being here with you. But I'm going to let David kick things off uh, and just fire away the questions because, of course, there's a lot of things to talk about. We've got... Um, a lot happening in the world of both Scottish football and uh, German football being one of the major divisions that is returning. Uh, and then we want to talk about, obviously, your life as a commentator as well. Both, of course, me and David, are aspiring journalists uh, and uh, commentators, you could say. So it will be good to have your insight on all things. So, David, oh, you go fire away, son. I'm just absolutely delighted not just to have just Ryan to talk to. I mean, he's, he's brilliant and all that, but it's <laughs> nice to have a bit of a variety on the channel. Um, so obviously it's a mad time for football, Derek. You know we know how um, big you are in your Bundesliga and, and, and all stuff like that. So obviously Germany, the Bundesliga is returning this weekend. So um, I know obviously you've not been up to date with what's going on over in Scotland, but um, you know how is the sort of reaction, reaction between Germany, Germany to the football, football returning from, from you know the average, the average people? people? Is it like a, are they supportive, supportive of it? Is there worries? What's, 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 what's kind of the route in terms of football returning in Germany? Well, I think, David, it would be fair to say that it's not without controversy in Germany. You have people who are very keen to have it back, who have greatly missed it, who feel that Saturdays are not the same without football. And, of course, it will be different given that we have Geisterspiele, as we say in German, ghost games, no fans. But against that, you have a large slice of the population that's not interested in football. And if you look at most of the recent opinion polls, they are split and there's an advantage for the people who actually don't want um, football at the moment in terms of the numbers. So, um, you know, we're all football fans. We love football. We're happy football is back. But I think as a matter of social responsibility, we have to acknowledge that for some people, it's a little bit too soon. That They don't necessarily think that it should be a priority to have football being played in a stadium again at a time when there is still uncertainty about COVID-19 in Germany. But Um, Restrictions are being loosened. Germany, of course, has been ahead of most other European countries in how they have dealt with this. And the DFL, the organizing body with regard to the Bundesliga and the second Bundesliga, has been very keen to get games back in business as soon as possible. And they'll tell you, for some clubs, it's a matter of survival. Yeah, of course, it's the same everywhere. I think in Scotland, especially there's clubs, especially in the lower divisions, you know, all the talk um, in Scotland has been about sort of Celtic and Rangers have been leading the, the discussions and stuff and the, the controversy, etc. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the clubs themselves, has there been a unanimous sort of agreement with the clubs in terms of getting things back or have there been kind of headaches in the process of, of agreeing the next steps forward? It's different when you talk about the first and second division in Germany and then lower down the divisions. So in the first and second divisions, and they come under the auspices of the the DFL, which has been a very successful body since uh, it took over running 
divisions, so two divisions of 18 teams, and the clubs in those divisions very much want football to come back, and of course it is coming back this weekend. So, um, so you've got that argument on the one side. Then if you go down the divisions, if you look at the third division, now that is not run by the DFL. So if you think of the DFL, a bit like the SPFL in Scotland, uh -huh. you have the DFB, which is the equivalent of the SFA in Scotland, so the, the Football Association. So they run the third division and also women's football, the top division of women's football in Germany. Now, in the third division, there is a huge divide. Um, a slight majority of clubs in the third division would like to come back, and the plan is to come back on the 26th of this month. But you have a number of other clubs who want to cancel the season now who don't uh -huh. want any part of it. And the reason for that is that the TV money is not quite what it is in the third division. In fact, not by a long way is it the same as it is for the first and second division clubs. And so a lot of these other clubs are looking at operating costs. They're looking at the overall cost of having to implement hygiene measures in a small stadium because it is very specific what you have to do in order to, to pass this hygiene test, so to speak. And they just feel that this is not worth it at all um, the costs of keeping players uh, training and, and all these other factors. So you have this division in the third division and another division lower down the divisions where everything is done on a regional basis in the fourth division set up. You have some regional leagues who want to carry on and some who have no interest in it. So it, it, it's, there's not one kind of uniform German answer you can give to uh -huh. that question. It's a great question, but it really does uh, differ from league to league and region to region. I know Ryan. Ryan, you're big on the Bundesliga. You're excited for it coming yeah, back this weekend. I'm, I'm absolutely ecstatic. Somebody, I, I'm a, I'm a Borussia Dortmund man, uh, Derek. In case uh, you're looking for any context, but uh, this, it was really annoying this season because this was the year I felt like um, for once. Dortmund had a really good chance over the past few years of actually pushing Bayern to maybe the final, you know, stages of the season. It seems the last couple of years, you know, they fell away after the winter break sort of time. Bayern have sort of rose ahead and, uh, and and took the title for their own. Do you think that with the Bundesliga coming back now at this point after a two-month break, it's going to slow things up a bit for some teams? Do you think it's like the season starting again? It's like people are sitting there trying to pick who they think is going to win all the games this weekend when it comes to pick a Kutten or whatever, but... I think, for me, I just feel like it's like that kind of first game of the season vibe. You know, it's sort of, you don't know what to expect, especially because all the stadiums are empty. You've not seen players playing a professional game of football over two months. It seems quite difficult. What's your thoughts towards it? My initial thought, Ryan, would be that we'll probably see a few surprises. We'll probably see things happen that we wouldn't see in your normal Bundesliga week mm -hmm. and that comes down to as you've said the fact that we're not going to have the atmosphere that we usually have we're going to have different teams at different stages of their training development Werder Bremen for example have been complaining a bit about having to go straight back into action because locally and Germany is a very decentralized country Mm -hmm. um, the UK not so much but in Germany everything is, is very decentralized so locally in Bremen they haven't had the same opportunities in terms of being able to train on a full contact basis that other clubs have had so they've sort of cried foul and said you know out of fairness out of competitive fairness um, this is not fair this is too early for us so I think you have to look at little things like that and also um, you know who's injured I suppose we'd be doing that anyway um, but, you know, I was looking at Hoffenheim, for example. They don't have a striker, it seems. Aye, All the strikers are, are, are injured for one reason or another, so they're going to have to improvise. And they play Hertha, who have a new coach in Bruno Labadia and might be really up for this. So little things that we might normally take into, not take into account, sorry, we will have to take into account this time. So as this is a question that I, I, is kind of going back a little bit from the current moment in time, just to get some context from yourself. As a fellow Scotsman growing up, I, I've got a big interest in German football, but yourself, was there ever, when you were younger, did you have a big interest in German football? How did you kind of find your way into getting into that side of things? Because it just, for me, you know, obviously it seems like, you know, a lot of the, the British journalists that you, you kind of know of and hear of are always kind of focused around the British game, but you're really a kind of entrepreneur for pushing the the uh, the German the German side of things over here. Like, if you look on Twitter, you know, there's always one guy going for the Bundesliga stuff, and that's yourself. So, how did you find yourself getting out? Was it just an opportunity presented to you, or did you kind of want to be there uh, when you were getting into things? I'm really glad you've asked me that question because it's very dear to my heart and, and I can talk a lot about my own experiences uh, when I was a lot younger. And when I was seven, 
the 1974 World Cup took place in West Germany. Mm -hmm. The first World Cup I can remember watching, and I was obsessed with it. And not just the football, but this new country was uh, opened up to me. So, of course, uh -huh. West Germany, East Germany were both in that World Cup. They played each other in that World Cup. Um, so I developed a real interest at a young age in, in Germany. I wanted to do everything about Germany, its geography, um, and then the language. And that came a couple of years later at primary school when German was the language, much to my delight, that we learned. And I realized that I had a bit of a knack for it. And um, one of the great things about living in Aberdeen is you have a connection because of the North Sea all the way to Hamburg in northern Germany. And it means you can get radio from, um, from Hamburg, uh, mm -hmm. a channel called Ende Air. Now, for you guys, you'll think, well, what's the big deal? You could get that on the Internet. But we didn't have Internet in those uh -huh. days. We, did, we didn't have anything like that. So the idea of being able to switch on your radio and, and listen to Germany every day, that's something that I did. Um, being a football fan as well, I quickly realized that when the matches were on, I could listen to the, the Bundesliga Konferenz, as they call it. So it, um, it killed two birds with one stone. It meant that my German got better. And, and also I could listen to football in German. How about that for a combination? So, um, so I sort of carried this forward and, um, you know, took an extra interest in, in all things German, but especially German football. And then when I first started going to Germany as a teenager, um, I obviously began going to matches. This would be the 1980s by now. And it was a very different football culture back then. It wasn't the, the full stadia culture that we have nowadays. It was terracing. It was underfunded to a large extent. It was an amateur game in Germany um, mm -hmm. until, you know, some, some, until after some of the early years of the, the Bundesliga's existence. The Bundesliga was founded in 1963. But um, I just found that it, it's really appealed to me in terms of the language. Um, and I thought I probably professionally would do something with the language. I wasn't sure that I'd be able to become a broadcaster because in those days, not many people got to become broadcasters. Right. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a secondary thing. Uh, in addition to uh, amateur broadcasting, there was this uh, interest in German. And the two just managed to come together. And I went to uh, teach, actually, in a, a small school um, right on the border of the two Germanys, west and east. When I say right on the border, I mean, you know, 20 yards away was the border. And you can see the east Jeez. German border guards looking in with a binoculars looking over to the west. Um, and, and that took it to another level altogether. Uh, when I began working for the BBC, whenever a Scottish team had a German team, and I was lucky enough that that happened quite a lot, then mm -hmm. I always sort of felt, right, I'm in position to give it a bit of, you know, extra uh, information here that nobody else is going to give. And I've just sort of carried that through my professional life. And in recent years, I've been in Germany a lot more working for the Bundesliga's World Feed. So what's a World Feed, people ask? Well, if you listen to or watch a game um, with English language commentary coming from the Bundesliga, then it comes with world feed commentary. It's up to the individual broadcaster if they take that world feed commentary, but it comes as part of the service, if you like, so that if somebody is watching in Africa or Australia or the Middle East, then they can simply switch on the game from Germany and it comes with English language commentary. So uh, I don't get to do that every week because I live here in Massachusetts in the USA, but mm -hmm. I do normally <clears throat> spend quite a bit of time in Germany working on that too. So that's the long-winded answer to the question, but Germany is, is very much in me. See, I, I attempted that, that route myself. When I started the university, I decided, do I'm going to take German as a, a second subject. Good. I think I've, I lasted six months. <laughs> I oh, I, no. <laughs> it was just, it, see, it's just so, it, it's such a, a, a weird language to understand. We're all the different, you know, what, all the tense and stuff. It's, 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 really, a, it's the hardest language to learn. It really uh, is. Honestly, I, I thought I was giving it a good go, but. Um, you did touch on one part that I'm going to come back over to Dave in a second. You, you were talking about the kind of culture that we now recognise in Germany with the fans. Obviously, one of the um, one of the most iconic fan cultures in the world. People always look to the the derbies and the, the, the you look at Dortmund with the the yellow wall and everything else. David, you wanted to touch on the culture and stuff, didn't you? So I'm going to pass yeah, it back over to David. Yeah. Um, firstly, just to pick on on something you sort of said there, Derek. Um, obviously, your knowledge of German football, the German language and stuff, has helped you, you know, in terms of being able to further your career. How important do you think it is for sort of aspiring journalists and stuff to have something a little bit niche, a little bit different that can help them sort of open up opportunities? I think it's really important, and I think it's the sort of thing I say to all young aspiring broadcasters and journalists: make yourself unique. You know, don't just follow the herd. 
um, have something in your repertoire that is you and and only you. And and I feel with German, I've been lucky to have that. I'm not saying I'm the only German speaker amongst broadcasters <laughs> or journalists, you know, far from it. But um, I've, I've always put a lot of time and effort into it. And it has, um, you know, given me advantages over my competitors. And we are in a very competitive business. So it doesn't have to be a language. You know, it, it could be a specialist knowledge of one particular form of football, of one country, having contacts in a particular area. And, you know, I, I certainly have noticed in the last couple of weeks, my um, uh, telephone has, has, has lit up my mobile phone, my emails um, with people who want to talk to me because I cover the Bundesliga and, and probably have knowledge that most people don't. It would be the same if, um, you know, if Dutch football were the first league to come back, you'd have people with knowledge of the Eredivisie who'd be getting, who'd be getting calls from everyone. So um, I, I'm glad you've asked that too, because I, I do think that it's very easy just to kind of say, okay, we'll just go along with what everybody else is doing. And, you know, we'll, we'll follow the crowd here. And, uh, you know, I, I think in our business, it is so important to be able to make yourself different and, and have a skill and, and that means time and effort. You know, that means a few extra hours doing something maybe you don't always want to do. Um, but I would just say, trust me, one day it will be worth its weight in gold to you. Yeah, um, that, yeah, that's exactly kind of what I thought in terms of, you know, especially nowadays, it's such sort of a crowded um, industry. Some people want to get into it and, you know, the harsh reality is, you know, few actually succeed, you know. Hopefully, yeah. me and Ryan will be one of that few, but um, <laughs> no, we'll yeah. have to see. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to touch on what Ryan was saying about the, the culture, Ryan's obviously a lot, a lot more into his German football than I am in terms of watching it regularly, but for me... Um, as someone, As someone who, you know, will occasionally watch if Dortmund are playing or Bayern are playing. Play. The one thing that always strikes me about German, German football is the sort of difference in culture in terms of the supporters, supporters especially compared to over here. Yeah. You know, it's not, I don't think it's any surprise that so many people from Britain go and like footballing tours of Germany and stuff like that. You know, so what, what do you think is the sort of main differences in sort of the, the culture in terms of, you know, from a, I suppose from the supporters kind of aspect? It's less corporate, and that might be a strange thing to say to two Scots, and I'm obviously Scottish as well, and, and I've worked a, a large chunk of my life in Scotland. Um, but even in Scotland, there is that corporate element that is not a feature of German football in the same way. And I think in Germany, what I love uh, doing in Germany when I'm not working is making a whole day of it, and that means starting early in the city centre, uh, it means maybe having a Bratwurst beside the, the railway station. Um, because I speak German, it means um, listening in on conversations and, and what fans are saying and thinking. Mm -hmm. And then the other great thing is that, um, you know, you, you leave from the, the, the railway station and you jump on a local train or a local bus or a local tram to the stadium. And that is part of the match ticket. You know, so the match ticket includes that. And the great thing is that away fans can jump on as well. And I've never seen trouble. You know, I've never seen trouble between rival uh. fans. It's just people all going to the game. And uh. this is the other thing about German football that people maybe don't understand, especially people in the UK. Yes, there is rivalry in Germany, but sometimes there's a coming together. And that coming together is with ultra groups from different clubs. So even though they support their team, above all else they sometimes have more in common with the ultras from the other clubs um than they do even with fans of their own club if, if that makes any sense at all and a lot of these things a lot of this coming together can be to do with um you know social issues socio-political issues things like mm -hmm. racism and, and opposing racism and opposing sexism in in venues and you know sometimes it can go the other way sometimes it can go in a direction that um, neutral fans don't like so much, such as happened recently with the, um, the patron of Hoffenheim and, and some mm -hmm. of the abuse that was hurled in his direction. But it's a complex kind of matter. And it, it's the one thing that I, I notice in, in Germany is that fans do have this social conscience that maybe is bigger than support of their club in the traditional way. Um, so I think you sort of have to take that into account. But during the game, the ultras are the ones who make the noise. So it's less kind of, in, in the UK, I always think it's kind of the ooh and ah of the crowd according to, to what's happening in the game. In Germany, you just have this constant mm -hmm. din for mm. the 90 minutes being generated by the fans behind the goal in the kurve, as we say. Um, and um, 
they'll have somebody leading those chants and some of them are political you know some of the, the chants are, are are political some are not some of the banners are political some are not but it's all part and parcel of of the german game it's all part and parcel of the culture of german football now you have other fans who go who are not really part of this culture in the same way they're simply watching the game and maybe not making as much noise uh, so it's a totally different experience going to the Kurve and standing for the whole game with the ultras or their equivalents uh, in comparison with going maybe to the halfway line where it's a bit quieter. Still can be lively, still can be good banter, but it is a different experience. Do you think, um, you know, in terms of, again, another thing that I always think about the sort of German culture is, it seems to me that like you said it yourself about not being corporate. The fans are almost, you know, put, put first, which is something we, we sort of cry out for in this country. Yeah. How does that affect the sort of attitudes towards the governing bodies in German football? Because, I, I you know, it's, at the best of times, the sort of relationship with Scottish football fans and the governing bodies in this country is, you know, it's, it's not great. And it's been, it's been even worse in recent weeks. But does the attitude towards the governing bodies in Germany, you know, um, reflect the sort of way fans are treated in the country? Um. It's an interesting question because the um, the ultras who I've mentioned, they tend to not have a great relationship with the governing bodies and they tend to, uh, at every chance, um, emphasize that they are not best pleased with the governing bodies. An example would be for, uh, you know, to give this example, um, the Monday night games in Germany. Now we weren't talking about many of them, just five in an entire season. And they were set up really to help teams who were in the Europa League on a Thursday have an extra day of rest. Um, so so there, there was a sort of an altruistic uh, way of thinking behind having these Monday games. It obviously helped television as well, but we're not going to have them anymore beginning next season. Um, sorry, 2022, because of the, um, the outpouring of discontent with, with those Monday games. So there's an example of that. Um, your average fan, I think, is probably the same as the average fan in Scotland. I mean, I, I think that, again, when we talk about disenchantment with governing bodies, we tend to think that every single fan thinks this way. Mm -hmm. And and it's probably not true in Scotland either. You know, there are fans in Scotland who like the game, but are not necessarily thinking about what the SPFL or the SFA are doing uh, every day of the week. Maybe, maybe there are more than I think. It's possible. Um, but in Germany, yeah, there are people who, who talk about that. But there are other people who simply like going to the games and uh, are less prone to, to talk in those terms. And I feel like there was one point that you brought up in the, the first part. You were talking about, obviously, the rivalry and there's a, a kind of coming together at points. I feel like there's been times where I've just, like, you know, watched like, the classic here and there's been, you know, Dortmund versus Bayern. You can say it's at the Allianz. You can see, like, the yellow shirts and the home end just, like, dotted around. It's just, like, you would never you would never get that over here. It's, like, impossible. I mean, especially when it comes to the big, big games. You know, if you look at Celtic and Rangers, it's, like, a, a completely... It can be a toxic environment at times, so it's 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 really such a different culture. I think that's one of the things that really does draw me um, to the German game. It's just you know the, the kind of football kind of comes first, um, and sometimes I feel like we put up you know towards the back over here. It's quite annoying at times. Um, anyway, we're going to move on um, past the German kind of stuff just now. We wanted to talk a bit about BT Sport, of course, um, a company which you worked with uh, for a very long time. Still do, I'm correct, and, and do it in saying with the Bundesliga stuff. Um, of course, losing the rights to Scottish football was massive. Uh, it was something that I feel like, in unison, everybody who's a fan of Scottish football could say, was really disappointed to see after the coverage that it gave uh, Scottish football over the past few years since it became a thing. What was your initial reaction to uh, BT losing out on the, the rights to Scottish football? Well, obviously, when that news came through, I was long gone. Uh, I mm -hmm. joined BT Sports team in 2013 when the channel started, and I made the decision to leave to come back here to the USA in 2017. Um, so, um, obviously, I talked to a lot of the, the crew. They're, they're all friends of mine. And, you know, th there was concern for a while about what would happen with the rights, and that's the nature of our business. We go through these rights cycles, and as broadcasters, we never know what's going to happen, and we're at the mercy of our bosses uh, coming up with the right decision from our point of view. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was disappointing because what I can say is that every member of that BT sport team in Scotland put his or her heart and soul into the productions and we made that decision from day one uh, grant phillips the the head of the production crew martin keegan the producer 
Daryl Curry, the presenter. I was the commentator the first four years. We all agreed at the very start. We were all Scots. We were all proudly Scottish. We all loved our Scottish football. So let's present something that, um, if you like, chimes with what Scottish football fans like and want themselves. You know, we felt that maybe in the past there hadn't been enough positivity around the Scottish game. It had been sort of presented almost from the point of view of of somebody in London looking up at Scottish football rather than somebody in Scotland, you know, looking from on high at Scotland itself and not trying to compare it or contrast it with anybody else. Because um, it's one thing I, I learned when, uh, when I first came here to the USA, there was this concept on the Spanish language channels of what they called nuestro football and what they meant by nuestro football in spanish was our football and they meant latin american football so they meant you know mexican football they meant argentinian football they meant all the football that was dear to their to their hearts and um uh, you know obviously these were people who you know had grown up with the game and were living in a culture where maybe the, the game wasn't as organic well i sort of felt when i went back to scotland and i went back in 2009 firstly with espn that this idea of nuestro football was very important. I was a, a Scot who'd lived away for a long time, but I never stopped loving Scottish football. And um, I thought, well, fresh perspective is good. Let's come back with a fresh perspective. And to me, that meant being positive. And most of the people who ended up with BT Sport were also there with ESPN UK. And actually, the majority were with Satanta prior to that. I wasn't, but a few of the other guys were. So, you know, these are all people who lived and breathe Scottish football. So, yeah, on a personal level, very disappointing that a good thing had to come to an end. It, it does seem like um, for the guys that were working for BT, you mentioned someone there, there's a, sort, there's a real sense of pride in the work. And I, I guess that reflects what you were talking about in terms of trying to be positive about Scottish football and stuff. And even the pundits you have on, I mean, Chris Sutton's a very divisive figure, but for an Englishman who's who's come to Scotland, he doesn't have big up Scottish football. And it's, it's I suppose it's just really refreshing. And I think people worry with, you know, so with the rights going back to Sky, who... You know, they always have the big games. That's, that's one of the things that strikes me. Sky always have the old firm games, the big games that everyone, that everyone wants to watch. To watch. But, but the coverage, coverage on BT, they, they can make like the smallest of games, games seem like a really sort of something to be proud of for, for Scottish football fans. I mean, you've seen it with like, um, they did like the championship playoffs, they had like Livingston Party Fizzle. These big teams, these, sorry, these smaller teams weren't getting the sort of platform to be discussed in the way that they, they were with BT, which I think, you know, the refreshing sort of nature of the coverage really chimed with them. Um, Scottish football fans, which must have been something, you know, that the team were really proud of. Absolutely. I think that was the one thing that everybody at the start wanted to achieve was to, to show Scottish football um, in the way that Scots love it, you know, and, and to not just make it, by the way, about two big clubs. Two big clubs are very important to the narrative. But, you know, I certainly as a commentator found that my most enjoyable commentaries were almost without fail in connection with teams who weren't Celtic and Rangers. Now, there were big Celtic games, there were big Rangers games. Mm -hmm. But I always think we let ourselves down in Scotland if we just make two clubs because we're missing the point of, of what our sport is. I mean, we talk Absolutely. a lot about how passionate Scots are about football. Are they just passionate about two clubs? I don't think so. You know, I think mm -hmm. every, every fan of every team is passionate and every team has a story. And this was the one thing about Rangers um, trying to come from the, the bottom tier to the top tier. Uh, and, you know, people said, oh, you know, why are you covering so many games? Why are you giving that attention? Well, people obviously wanted to watch the games. But I will tell you, as a commentator, what gave me most pleasure during those years, uh, and I don't think any commentator will ever get this again, was being able to go to all these smaller venues that I had grown up with. I hadn't been to all of them, I've been to some, but to be able to commentate from those venues and tell those stories. And, you know, again, you could say it was a bit of a quirk of fate because of, um, you know, Rangers being where they were. But I, I doubt a commentator will ever get to go to Glebe Park or to go to Shieldfield or to mm -hmm. go to Steer Park ever again and broadcast big time football. So I'm, I'm actually grateful that my time back in Scotland coincided uh, with those years and we got to cover them on BT Sport. Have you ever had a game in Germany, Germany that you've covered where a football has got uh, caught in a hedge at the side of the pitch? Has that ever happened in Germany? <laughs> no, it hasn't. No, and, and that, that was a real treat. And I have a bit of a connection with Brechin because my dad was, was somewhat of a Brechin City fan from his time when he um, worked with the post office in, in Brechin <clears> way back in the, would have been 19, late 50s. And um, so I always had sort of this idea, Brechin were my, my second local team. And, you know, being from Aberdeen, 
Brecon's down the road. It's the, it was the closest team to Aberdeen in those days. So if we want to watch another team, it would be Brecon. Um, so to do a live game from there was tremendous. And uh, Grant Phillips, our, our match director, he got some terrific shots from overhead of the hedge. And um, it, it really brought it to life. And um, yes, yeah, so we're very proud to have been part of that. I know, I'm sure David's delighted to hear that. David's a massive Dunfermline fan, so you know he's he's constantly winding me up about uh, you know the kind of the, the Celtic Rangers thing, you know, being the, the two teams and then uh, claiming it how much better it is uh, East End for himself. So he'll be he'll be chuffed to hear that. Uh, working with BT, I talk about the guys you're working with. Do do you have any sort of moments with them that you look back on and you think to yourself like? Oh, I, I, I kind of miss that about Scottish football. Is there any, any time you ever consider maybe bringing yourself back over? Well, to answer the second part first, um, it's unlikely, Brian, I, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, to go back in time, I, I obviously grew up in Scotland um, and worked there with the BBC until 1991, until I made the decision to, to move to the USA and then came back in 2009 uh, with ESPN UK. Didn't know for how long it ended up being eight years, eight magnificent years. But I've always been a big believer when you close the chapter, you close the chapter. You keep and, it closed, um, uh... Yeah, I'd made the decision that I wanted to put everything into those eight years. I wanted to make an impression because you've got to remember when I came back in 2009, I'd been away for almost 20 years. So the majority of Scottish football fans wouldn't have had an earthly who I was. Uh, they wouldn't <laughs> have known me at all because my work wasn't really being broadcast in Scotland. They might have known it if they lived somewhere else around the world. But most mm-hmm. Scots didn't know who I was. And um, I felt I had something to prove. And um, with that in mind, you know, gave it absolutely everything. But I was conscious of the fact that maybe this, you know, is tied into um, having something to prove. I was conscious of the fact that it was going to be a limited spell because my wife is American. We didn't sell a house here in the Boston area. You know, I'm always going to have connections here. So someday I was going to come back here. Um, so you never say never, you know, who's to say what could happen down the line. Um, you know, maybe people have had enough of me, you know, two spells in Scotland. Maybe that, that is long enough. I don't, honestly, no, that's not, that's not the case. Anybody you ask, honestly, everybody that I know is like, Derek, we need Derek back. That's, that's uh, the main thing you hear. Well, it's kind of, if anybody does think that, it's very nice of them to say so. I, I just want to say, <laughs> I, I, I had a wonderful time back in Scotland and I really cherished every game. And, and, you know, every experience. And so the other part of your question, uh, you know, what do I miss? What, what I miss most is the chat and the people. And mm-hmm. you know, that to me is Scottish football. And, um, you know, all my teammates, obviously, you know, everybody I worked with on the air, everybody who was part of the, the behind the scenes staff, whose names you won't know, but, but who are, trust me, you know, the people who, who make these productions come to life. Um, but also for me, the people um, at the various clubs. And I had my routine on a match day. And what I would, I would, I would, I would become probably a slightly different person on match day. I'd go into my little zone and I'd go into the tunnel area. I'd have almost the same conversations with the same people before every game. And they could be the kit man. They could be one of the assistant coaches, a goalkeeping coach, uh, a cleaner, a security person. You know, the same people who you see in the sort of the two hours leading up to a game because I would just park myself there. And that's, to be honest, where I got a lot of my little stories that I could use on the air, last minute stories. Oh, how's he been training this week? Oh, he picked up a, a little hamstring. When was that yesterday? Okay. Uh, oh, the boss was in for lunch here yesterday. Oh yeah, he brought five people, five of his oldest friends. You know, little things like that mm-hmm. um, that are just kind of off the cuff remarks. And it's amazing how you can make them into stories on the air. And I tried very consciously to do that, to bring home that side of Scottish football that we all love. So that's what I still miss to this day. You know, I miss when I, um, when I see that there's a game at Hamilton or somewhere and it's on TV and I sort of think, okay, you know, yeah, once upon a time I'd be in my tunnel routine by now. I'd be talking <laughs> to Danny, the kit man. He'd be telling me everything I need to know. I'd be getting ready to talk to one of the managers and I'd get some information from him. And then I'd be walking around the stadium, saying hello to a couple of fans on the way to the, um, the gantry there on the other side of the ground. And, and those are the things that you miss. And, and certainly from my point of view, you know, that's probably the, the, the biggest void. Uh, the, the people, the atmosphere in terms of talking to these people and all the laughs. Do, you, you obviously speak very highly of the crew that you worked with at BT. Is there a, a real sense of sort of 
almost like team spirit amongst that crew? Is it, is it working together to sort of almost make each other better? The reason I ask this is because it's just come to my head there thinking about Daryl Curry. Obviously, his reputation has soared in recent years. I think think back to the Europa League final of last season, um, that interview did in Hazard that was you know all over the world and stuff. It was a big moment for him. Um, obviously, you weren't there then, but is there always that sort of sense of team spirit in the BT Sport crew? Were they sort of working together and sort of you know, proud of the work they produced as a team? Let me just answer your point about Daryl. Um, you're right, I wasn't there when Daryl did the interview with Azar, but I did watch it here in the USA. And I have to say, I, I, I was just full of pride when I saw that. I thought, there's, there's Daryl. Nobody does it better than Daryl. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, Daryl and I go back to the ESPN days. We first met each other in the summer of 2009. And um, there was a big meeting that was, was held of all the, the on-air personnel. And the two of us just, you know, the two Scots went off and, and had, a, had a pint around the corner and I think very quickly realized we were going to be fast friends, that, that we saw things in a very similar way. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to, to call Daryl one of my best friends. And um, I've got nothing but the utmost respect for him as a professional, uh, but also as a guy. And, uh, and I'm so glad that, as you said, his career has, uh, has soared uh, and will continue to soar of that, I have no doubt. But... Yeah, I think we all, we all had a bit of a point to prove in our own way, you know. So if you think about it, the people who had come from Satanta, that had ended. Um, ESPN, that had ended. So I think there was always maybe a slight kind of, I'm not going to say chip on the shoulder, but a slight kind of, okay, you know, we better be really good here because we're conscious of what can happen in this business. And I know that. I mean, I've been in this business for most of my life. And um Disappointment is around the corner, and a lot of it can be rights-related. The reason I came back to Scotland in 2009 was that we at ESPN had just lost the Champions League rights, which had been my bread and butter for almost a decade. And I could have continued doing the USA, but we agreed to come up with a sort of an ad hoc um, situation whereby I go back to Scotland and do the, the Scottish games that had to be done in addition to coming back here to the USA and taking care of business over here. Uh, after a year, we decided that that wasn't sustainable and, and I went back to the UK full time. But I think everybody on that production team knew that it was important to make every moment count. I think we also knew that Scottish football, as I said earlier, um, hadn't always been presented in the best light. You know, it had been, for some people, a bit of an afterthought. And I have to say, I, to come back to the Celtic Rangers thing, there was a big change that, that happened in the years when I went away. Because I don't remember when I was there in the 80s and 90s, and I was there for BBC Scotland um, as a commentator and a presenter. I don't remember us ever presenting the game back then, and it was a different era, as this kind of duopoly. I don't remember it mm -hmm. being this kind of two tribes thing. And then all of a sudden... In the, the years after 1991, when I would go back to Scotland on holiday or, or get tapes sent from Scotland, I would see that it had been turned into this, oh, the Celtic Rangers game, that's the only game you want to watch. Forget about the rest of it. It doesn't mean anything. And I'm thinking, when, when did this come about? Who, who invented this? You know, Who came up with this idea that there's yeah. only one fixture worth watching? And yeah, granted, it's a very big fixture. It's a, one of the biggest derbies in the world. But we are remiss as TV people if we confine ourselves to only selling that one game. I mean, what, why would you do that? And what other business would you only sell one game? Try and sell everything. Um, so um, everybody did that. And I think the advantage was in having a group of people who were either Scots or had lived most of their lives in Scotland or you know, had Scottish football as big parts of them and wanted to convey that to a wider audience. Spot on. Um, so, I mean, David, is there anything you want to add quickly before we kind of take things elsewhere? I don't know if there's much you want to add. And just just like quickly on, the, <clears throat> on what you were saying there, Derek, the, the idea, even to people of, sort of me and Ryan's age, that teams like Aberdeen and Dundee United would be challenging for top flight titles in Scotland is, is a crazy notion that you wouldn't even think was possible. So obviously we've had so many years now of Celtic Rangers domination, I think it's almost become a sort of ingrained attitude with people who who grew up sort of watching football. And that's why I think BT is, is coming across so well, um, is that they've tried to change that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. in terms of sort of back then, in sort of 80s and 80s, when you first started um, started commentating on games, who were the sort of, you know, obviously Celtic and Rangers weren't the only teams that were talked about. Back then, who were the sort of big, big teams that, you know, would really challenge the old farm far up near the top of the table? Well, at that time, and I got my first professional gig in 1986, 
I'd been working on an amateur basis for hospital radio for the years prior to that. And of course, I'm from Aberdeen. So, you know, the Aberdeen games were, uh, you know, first and foremost for me. And, you know, you're talking about a team in 1983 that won the Cup Winners' Cup. We've just been commemorating it this week, actually, 37 years this past Monday that Aberdeen beat Real Madrid in the final of the Cup Winners' Cup. And then a few months later went on to win the Super Cup, beating Hamburg of Germany. And I had Willie Miller on the, the program I was doing for Aberdeen's Red TV, um, looking back at 83 with, with uh, four of the legends, Willie, Neil Simpson, John Hewitt, and Eric Black. And Willie was very quick to point out when I put it to him that Aberdeen were probably the best team in Europe in 1983. He said, there's no probably about it. He goes, we were, and they, he's right on this, number one in Europe. There were, there were fledgling rankings in those days and Aberdeen were the best team in Europe. And um, so when I got my first professional start, you still had this dynamic of, of Aberdeen being very strong and, and Fergie was still the manager. Mm -hmm. was still the boss at that time. That was to change a few months later. You had a very good Dundee United team managed by Jim McLean. And I was lucky enough to follow them all the way to the UEFA Cup final in 1987. Again, for younger people watching and listening, they'll be thinking, you know, is this a parallel universe that we're in? <laughs> Dundee United, best teams in Europe. But I mean, that was not very far from the truth. You had Rangers in 1986 who... Um, were about to embark upon a new era with Graham Souness as their manager. And this was the era of English teams being banned from European competitions. So suddenly you had this exodus of English players uh, making their way to Glasgow to play for Rangers under Graham Souness, the likes of Chris Woods and Terry Butcher and Graham Roberts and several others, later Mark Haightley. Um, and that changed things as well. And you had a Celtic team that sort of somehow was managing to still be in the equation, even though um, you know, they, they at times struggled against Aberdeen. Um, Dundee United, they had a better head-to-head -head record against, but still Dundee United, Aberdeen, Celtic could all be much of a muchness, could all push each other. And Rangers had been down for a few, for a few years. They were only just coming back up under Graham Sooner. So I will say to people, and I shouldn't forget Hearts either, because Hearts really should have won the title in 86, um, my first commentary year and um, lost to Celtic. I was actually at uh, Love Street the day when Celtic um, clinched the title uh, mm -hmm. in an unexpected fashion when Hearts lost at Dens Park. So, I mean, just think about the excitement that goes with an era like that when you have genuine competition. You do not know at the start of each season who's going to win. And maybe, again, this is where my frustration with the idea of the duopoly comes because I grew up in an era where there was not a duopoly at all. We had multiple winners of competitions. And my goodness, was our football so much better for that. You take it back, <clears throat> back into the modern day a little bit, just quickly before we kind of move on to the last couple of segments in the show. Um, one question that a lot of people wanted me to ask you is in your second spell here in, in Scotland, just because this slipped my mind completely, would I be right to say, this is me thinking off the top of my head here, would I be right in saying your last game would have been the uh, Hamilton and Dundee United. Uh, is that correct? I'm trying to think. So up until that, up until that point on your return, what what, what was there a standout moment for you to cover? Was so just one that you think of and you come back to and go, "That was." I, I'm I'm glad I came back for that reason. Like just one specific game or whatever. The, any big moment? The one that really there's probably two actually when I think about it. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so maybe you'll allow me two because it, it's quite hard to separate them. Feel free, feel free. Um, um, one was, was definitely the moment um, at Tynecastle when Hearts beat Hibs 2-0. A late goal by Billy King sealed it. And you'll think, well, why would that be so special? Hearts were to be relegated that season. Hibs were also to be relegated that season, as it turns out. We didn't suspect it at the time. This That's was right. March uh, of that year. And um, the reason it was so special was... Hearts were going to go down, but imagine the ignominy of being relegated by your city rivals on your own patch. Yep. And again, this is where the sort of the tradition of Scottish football comes in for me and why it, it lights me up so much. Um, I love the Edinburgh Derby. It, it, it is probably my favorite Scottish fixture, more so than Celtic Rangers, because I've covered it more often than Celtic Rangers. Um, you mentioned earlier, Sky tended to take the Celtic Rangers games. Yeah. So I found real joy in the Edinburgh Derby. And a lot of it had to do with having friends from Edinburgh, having been there on so many occasions, um, mm. having read the likes of Ian Rankin and Irvin Welsh and all their tales of 
of Edinburgh banter. And um, I, I found it all very inspirational. And to have this story of hearts, you know, heart of Midlothian. I mean, it's a great name for a football club, no matter who you support. Hibernian, not a great name. Um, <laughs> hearts playing Hibernian on this stage. Hearts fans privately dreading what was to happen. And then there's this outpouring of joy as they make sure they don't get relegated that day. And a lot of it has to do with the, the, the commentary words that I found to um, sum up that Billy King goal. Some of the favorite commentary words that I've ever managed to utter in a live game. So I, I think that one has to go down as, as very special. The other one, and you mentioned the playoff, Hamilton against Dundee United. All the playoffs for me were very special. And we had exclusive rights to those playoffs on BT Sports. So maybe again, everybody put a bit of extra effort oomph into those ones. But um, when Motherwell um, took on Rangers in the, the playoff, that again was as tense uh, an occasion as I can remember. And I've been at Fur Park so many times down the years. I've never heard Fur Park as loud as it was that day when Marvin Johnson scored the goal early in the second half. He went on a zigzagging run. Uh, he, he fired a shot and it took a huge deflection um, and went over the head of Cammy Bell. Cammy Bell didn't cover himself in glory uh, and into the mm -hmm. back of the net. And the reason why that resonates with me as a commentator was in the first leg at Ibrox, the Motherwell boys, as they call themselves, the, uh, the, the ultras uh -huh. of Motherwell, um, I always made a point of trying to mention them on the air because I thought they were trying to do a number of good things. They were trying to increase the atmosphere levels at Fur Park. And after that game at Ibrox, when Motherwell prevailed in the first leg, 3-1, um, I did what I often do. I sort of just walked around, stayed behind, and the Motherwell fans were still in place. And they performed this magnificent rendition of the old twist and shout song. Uh, brilliant. It was, it was superb. And actually, I've got it on my phone somewhere to this day. I kept it. And, as, a, um, as a massive Beatles fan, that always tickled me. I enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, this is what fans can do. It doesn't have to be just the usual chance. So that stayed with me. And then when, so when Johnson scored that goal, um, what I said was, fur part, twisting, shouting, shaking, as Motherwell accelerates away from Rangers. And um, again, I'm so glad that I had the benefit of watching that performance of Twist and Shout from a few <laughs> nights before, because uh, it ended up being a commentary line. It's, it's not just those two games, sorry, Ryan, those two games are not just, they don't just stick with you because the two moments of commentary that I always remember from you in my head are the two games you've just mentioned. It was the commentary after the Billy King goal and the Twisting and Shouting one as well. So. Yeah, that was that was definitely some of your some of your final work. <laughs> see that, see those uh, those sort of um, you know the, the scenes that you just come up with like that, you know, twist and shout and shaking. Did they, did they just come to you at the moment, like when stuff like that happens, or do you have it kind of like pre-planned, like you know, oh, I've got some in my head. You don't have them pre-planned, but you're always as a commentator thinking about situations. You're always mm -hmm. thinking about scenarios. You're thinking actually about what I always I always before a game, no matter where the game is, I always think. What is the story today? Mm -hmm. What is the story? You know, pare it down to one sentence or two sentences. What is the story today? And what might the story be? So you don't go into it thinking, right, I'm going to say this at this point. I'm going to say that at that point. But you're always kind of thinking about, about situations, um, you know, going into a game. And then those thoughts can evolve. You know, half time is your next kind of thinking point. And that's when you often chat with your co-commentator. It was Gary McAllister, actually, for both of those games. And yeah. it's sometimes when you chat with your co-commentator, you say something off air that, and you sort of think, OK, all right, that's, yeah, maybe that's, that's kind of solidified it in my mind. That's the story now, you know? And, and you don't even realize that that's what's in your brain and it comes out uh, on the air. And I had made reference to the twist and shout thing just a few minutes before that goal went in by chance. I think Grant Phillips, our director, got me a shot of the Motherwell fans. And I mentioned, yeah, I said that was quite the performance of Twist and Shout the other night. So when you say that, again, that plants another seed in your, in your brain. And with the Hearts one, it, it, um, I think what I said on, on, on air that time was um, not on this patch of Edinburgh land, not in a derby, no relegation today. Um, so, again, that just came from, I remember it with Gary at halftime saying, Hearts are up for this, Gary. I said, um, I said, they're not having it. They are not going to allow themselves to go down on this patch of land. And then, you know, you say it, and then it, it, it comes out in a different way sometimes. Um, but I think 
you would always make the mistake of pre-planning something because if you do that, it's, it, it wouldn't sound right. It would yeah, sound absolutely. pre-planned. It has to come from the heart. Yeah. Um, you know, it can be thematic. It can be something that's related to the theme in your head, but it has to come out at that time in an organic way. Spot on. I mean, I, I, I hate like, working for scripts and stuff, David. You know that through the videos. I just like to go right off the hook. Just go like, go for it. Try and speak from the heart. Um, right, David, do you want to add it? Because we're, we're kind of running. We don't want to keep you here all day, Derek. But, David, do you, you've got one couple of last things to, to finish there's, this there's up? One, there's one. Um, I've told a couple of mates that were, we had you coming on today, and every single one of them wanted me to ask you about the process for commentating on the FIFA games, the sort of process, that, how did that opportunity come about, what's it like um, recording it, all the rest of it, it's just, it's something we don't really know about actually how it all works, you know, so if you give us a wee insight into that, that'd be brilliant. Well, how it came about was I had been back here in the USA a couple of months, so this would be November 2017, and out of the blue, I received an email from somebody who was representing a video game company. Uh, it was all a bit vague. It was quite mysterious for a few days. <laughs> uh, but was I interested in having a chat? And you know, I was very interested because at that time, I'd come back here as a freelance and had a few things lined up, but was still you know, evolving in terms of um, trying to get a few new gigs. And um, so they basically were interested in talking to me, this video game company. And it emerged a few days later that it was the big one. It was EA Sports and it was FIFA. Um, and of course I was interested because the game is iconic. We all know it. Yep. Uh, we all know what it means to people around the world. Um, the difficult part was that I had to keep it quiet for about six months because at that stage it was still sort of a vague thing. And um, what they wanted was for me to be the voice of the Champions League on FIFA. Uh, one of the producers had been following my career for a long time. And as I mentioned earlier, I used to be the voice of the Champions League around the world on ESPN. So um, a lot of people perhaps associated me with that era of the Champions League when we had terrific finals, when we had you know Messi just coming on the scene, when we had uh, you know epics between Liverpool and Milan and Manchester United and Chelsea, the list goes on. So probably lucky to have been broadcasting at that time. Um, so then we got down to the business of recording. And when we record for FIFA, it's um, about 20 to 25 days in a studio. And it's uh, full days. It's vocally quite challenging, especially oh, if you think be. about the number of high notes we have to we have to do. <laughs> and so we, we have a rule whereby we don't do all the high notes in one session. We, you know, we do a little block of high notes, um, and then uh, a lot of it is lower or, or intermediate. And um, for me, a lot of it is names and um, and getting names right. And that's a big part of it for me yeah. uh, is making sure that the name, as far as possible is said in a way that the player and his family himself would say that name. It does lead to people um, getting on my case on social media nowadays because they're often very accustomed to hearing names said the wrong way, quite yep. frankly, um, because names get anglicized. But the bigger point is this is a worldwide game. It's good. And, you know, just as if we had a Scottish name, we would want that name to be pronounced correctly around the world. With a Portuguese name, we want the same thing, even though that may be at odds with what your average viewer in England, for example, is used to hearing. So it's a balance, a balancing act, but it's great fun. And what I can honestly say is I go in every day with a smile on my face and I leave with a smile on my face. It's just a real privilege to be part of it. It's absolutely uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's really interesting. Just one wee thing on that. Obviously, you did your first one was FIFA 19, and then you did again the FIFA 20. So, when you were recording for FIFA 20, was that a whole new set of re recording, or did or was a lot of the stuff from the year prior used, and you just had to sort of top that up? Um, it was a lot of new stuff for FIFA 20 because in FIFA 20 we had a lot of new features. Lee Dixon's my partner, as you know, on FIFA, and mm -hmm. um, we obviously had to create from scratch a lot of things that hadn't been done before. So uh, FIFA 19 was Champions League and Europa League, and then it has expanded a bit more into to FIFA 20. So you know some of the content can be can be used. Obviously, names that we do once you know can be used again, mm -hmm. um, but new features need to be to be done brand new. <coughs> I think, okay. uh, oh, sorry, Ryan. Right. I was just going to say when you're near the end, obviously we don't want to keep you all all, all day, Derek. Um, I've just got a few sort of quick fire questions for you written down, sure. and then I'll I'll pass to Ryan to sort of round things off. So um, just a few here, and just, just stuff that you've probably maybe covered this before, but it's just interesting. So firstly, your favourite game you've ever commentated on? 
Milan, Liverpool and Istanbul 2005 Champions League final. Perfect. Um, your favourite goal you've ever commentated on? Favourite goal? Ooh, I have to think about that one a little bit more. Um, favourite goal? There was a goal by Ronaldinho when he played for Barcelona against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu, and it was such a good goal. He had the fans at the Bernabeu of Real Madrid on their feet applauding. Um, fantastic. Um, your favourite uh, commentary line, favourite favor line you've ever uttered, whether it be to a goal or just something during a game, is there anything that sticks out in your mind? Obviously, you've mentioned the two with the Scottish games, but is there anything on a sort of wider spectrum that sticks in your mind? 2005, again, going back to... Uh, well, no, hang on. I'll give you the... Probably my favourite one would be the, the Dortmund-Schalke derby, which is my favourite German derby. 4-4 draw secured by a last-minute Naldo header to make it 4-4. Fourth Schalke goal. Uh, this is why they call it the mother of all derbies. <laughs> that was, like, that, was, a, that um, was a painful game, Matt. I remember watching. <laughs> <laughs> that was Sorry, painful. Ryan. Sorry. <laughs> um, is there a, a game or a moment that you didn't commentate on that you really wish you had done? 1983 Cup Winners Cup final in Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, also, this is um, your favourite co commentator you've ever worked with, someone who you've had great chemistry with and you've enjoyed covering games with? Anyone um, stands out? It would be wrong to, sing, to, to single anyone out because they've all been fantastic. Um, but uh, Craig Burley. Very good. And finally, um, apart from yourself, your favourite commentator in world football just now, someone you think is, is really, really top quality. Well, I'm going to go with somebody who is, uh, pleased to say, one of my best friends, but I also think he's just a terrific commentator and has been for a long time, not just on football, but on boxing. I'm talking about my pal, Ian Dark. Fantastic. Ah, fantastic guy. Well, that's fantastic. Fire through everything there, David. Well done. Done that quite quick. Some great answers. I mean, no, David don't know that I'll be paying to hear about Liverpool winning a... I'm not, I'm not a Liverpool man myself, so I, I, that was painful for me. And, but uh, who cares? It's brilliant. Thank you very much, Derek. I mean, you've been an absolute honour to have on the show. It, it, I mean, you've joined the illustrious list of, of Joe Cardle for the second man. Yeah, yeah. Joe back. Cardle, I've commentated uh, on quite a few of Joe's games down the years. Oh, uh, some guy. Uh, but thank you very much once again, Derek. Uh, well, honestly, uh, love to hear from you again, if ever possible. But uh, uh, it's been nice having you on, mate. Thanks for the invitation, guys. And the main thing is at the moment, Continue to stay safe. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. That's it. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for watching the, 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 the podcast, listening to the podcast on whatever platform you have. Make sure to share it out and all the rest of it. It would be much appreciated. Make sure to check out the socials of both David and Derek here, our guest. And uh, I will see you all next time.